It's going for it. When we pitched the idea of a night of clinical excellence in Torah, as a whole, our speaker, Dr. Zaleski's name came up immediately. Dr. Zaleski received his MD at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's the Vice Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology, Chief of Breaking Therapy Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Co-Leader of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Genital Urinary Disease Management Unit. He's an editor-in-chief of the medical journal Brady Therapy and has received several awards, including the Boyer Award for Excellence in Clinical Research, the Outstanding Teaching Award in the Department of Radiation Oncology, the 2009 Henschke Medal, the highest award of American Brady Therapy Society for achievements in Brady Therapy, and the 2009 Emanuel Van Dusen Award for Excellence in Translational Research. He has been the Castle Colony Top Doctor for 20 years, featured on New York Magazine. As with all our speakers, it's difficult to highlight Dr. Slutsky's many accomplishments, Though, I do suggest a fun exercise. Go to PubMed and look up Dr. Zlepsy. What looks like an original 37 results is actually 37 pages of medical literature. It truly is astounding. But as the theme of the night is that it's admiration of spiritual growth, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Dr. Zlepsy's amazing Torah capabilities and welcome him to the night. so much. It's a privilege to be here and so much of the emphasis I have right now in, in my practice is also in an academic setting. Um, the thrill of teaching students, the thrill of teaching our residents and our fellows um, and so a gathering like this is very special for me and I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my focus this evening will discuss the challenges which physicians have practicing medicine, but specifically according to the guidelines of halacha. And when you think about this challenge, it is so incredibly broad, it's so incredibly complex, and that's because so many aspects of medicine, as you become more and more aware of the, the complexity of medicine, so many of those aspects touch on halacha, and there are many aspects which we'll talk about briefly this evening, which I'm sure many of you have not even realized could interface with halacha. And the more you learn, the more you appreciate so many aspects of what a physician is involved in could touch on halacha in a very significant way. And so if we want to address those critical challenges that each of you may be facing, <coughs> in the years ahead. It's a recognition of that incredible complexity of halacha interfacing with medicine. And the way to address these challenges, which we'll be talking about this evening, is really pretty straightforward, but quite arduous and not always easy to accomplish. First and foremost, I think for a physician who is interested in practicing according to the guidance of halacha, there is an obligation on each and every one to be learning. Now learning also means keeping up with medicine. If you just read a textbook and that's it, that's really not, not enough. You have an obligation to learn as much in your field as humanly possible. I remember when a close friend of mine now, a colleague, his father-in-law took him to Rav David Cohn and had a question. Should he go to a mediocre school or an excellent school? Well, the excellent school would be more challenging when it would come to Shabbos. And Rav David Cohn said very clearly, it's your obligation to be the best doctor possible. It's your obligation to learn as much as possible so that you will ultimately treat your patients in the most caring, but most excellent and proficient way. Yes, you always have to learn, learn about medicine, learn about your field, and be up to date. And trust me, every couple of months, the field of medicine is changing. In my field in oncology, I would say what I'm training my residents right now in 2000, end of 2021, is almost very different than even four years ago. It is a, medicine is a dynamic field. But it's not just learning about medicine. According, if you want to practice according to the guidelines of halacha, you really need to be learning, learning halacha. 
learning and knowing what those various aspects are. Not necessarily, and certainly not to poskin your shilas, because physicians in general are not to be poskin shilas. They're to be interacting with the poskin, but they need to know when to ask and what to ask. And so the more you learn, the more you realize whatever aspects of medicine you are involved in, there is clearly some interface in halacha. And there is interface with the important caveat that you need to be aware, you need to be always learning, and finally, you need to be always asking. Never to be afraid to ask. I think we heard that from Dr. Weinberger just before. We can't poskin shilas, but we can know what to ask and always ask, and the more you ask, the more you learn, but the more you realize how one aspect of your Shiloh could be very different. I've been practicing for over 30 years, and I can tell you, I get still continued Shilohs that come up in my own mind as I ask post him. And some are very similar to others, but if you start making comparisons and think that you can figure out the actual psaq, and not need to rely on a posseg you're making a mistake because there's so many nuances in halacha and you need to bring that to the attention of a posseg and that's what makes the interaction and the interface between practice of medicine and halacha so much more complex so i'd like to just raise a few of these questions that have come up in my practice and this is just only a few and every time I, I come in, in particular, I, I have a Hashem, a, a Kesher with, with a number of poskim in, in America. I was very close with Rabbi David Feinstein Zatzal. And in Eretz Yisrael, I have a Hashem, a very close Kesher with uh, Gon Rabbi Asher Weiss, uh, Shlita, who uh, Rabbi Sprung is very close with, and his whole, uh, is, is really his, his educational program is very much linked to Rav Asher Weiss. And of course to Rav Silberstein, to, to other poskim as well, to try to get uh, insights from them on very complex questions. Of course, some of the most complex questions, which we were alluded to before, where Dr. Weinberg relates to life and death situations, the end stage disease <coughs> in particular, which generates so much anxiety among families because all families want to do everything that's possible to the patient who has end-stage disease. And then where do you draw the line? How much risk do you put the patient who has end-stage disease in? At what point do you say enough treatment? Or at what point do you say we didn't do enough? Dialysis, experimental treatments, and the like. What is that risk that is really allowed to be taken? And if a new therapy, for instance, becomes available, how obliged is that patient supposed to take any of those risks, the risks of the unknown, to be able to go ahead with a therapy at end-stage disease? Another very commonly asked question, and it came up a tremendous amount during the early stages of COVID, even in hospitals around here, is the pri prioritization in an intensive care unit. Where do you draw the line? There are only 10 beds in the ICU. Who gets those 10 beds? Is it the older patient? Is it the ones who have uh, children? Is it the ones who are uh, healthier to begin with? Or is it the one who has disease already and has a worse con medical condition? What are those exact elements and how do you make those decisions which are extraordinarily complex. And these are the subjects of Shilas and Chubas, modern Shilas and Chubas, that have been dealt with uh, by Rav Asher Weiss, by others as well. Patient confidentiality, moving on to even somewhat less severe. I get questions like this all the time. Uh, it even is for a shidduch. Uh, somebody has a situation where uh, they were read a shidduch for um, a, a person who had a disease 10 years ago. They're now cured, apparently. We want to know a little bit more. The family says, gives permission 
to ask the physician, what do you divulge? What are you allowed to divulge? In a very complex situation. What about to the family when there is a disease in the fam in, in for the patient, and the patient says, I don't want you to tell anybody in my family about this. Is that permitted? Would the, would the family be really allowed to know or should know, maybe in their best interest to know? What about a, a BRCA a gene that is, is, uh, is positive? Is there an obligation for the physician to be able to tell the other members of the family if the patient says, I don't want you to tell? And, and what about a despondent, depressed, ill person? And if you give all of the medical information to that person, he may get more ill, he may be more depressed. How much information are you obliged to divulge to the patient? I've had some patients who said, the family said, don't use the C word answer to them. Just say it was a little inflammation in his body. That's, that's a, an ethical challenge. Are you, are you permitted to do that? Shouldn't the patient be aware of what the situation is at hand? Or maybe the family knows better that if he or she had this information, it would cause a terrible depression and the patient would have no real cheshek, no great desire to live. It's extraordinarily complex. And these are situations that are dealt with the postkin. And I know of, when I've asked these shilas, I've asked it to Rav Asher Weiss, and he would say, if you know that the patient will be extraordinarily despondent and have no true desire to live, you don't need to divulge every aspect. You, you divulge what you need to in order to be able to treat the patient. But it's not always as simple as that. And each time you're faced with these questions, you really need to ask the question. How much risk, by the way, is too risky when contemplating surgery when there's a potential for cure? I had one patient who was a Rosh Yeshiva and, and uh, a well-known Rosh Yeshiva who had uh, an American, but then subsequently lived in Israel. And unfortunately, he developed a tongue cancer. He, his whole life was speaking. His whole life was teaching. And he had treatment, but it came back. And the only way to treat him was to remove the entire tongue. And he would be able to live, but he wouldn't be able to speak. It's a very difficult choice for a person to make. And he, as a rub, told me, I poskined my own Shiloh, which was interesting. And I said, I'm open ears, tell me. And he said, his whole life revolves completely around his speech, around his, his ability to be able to convey Torah to others. And without that, he has no life, he has no fears. And he said, to take a surgery that it's not a greater than 50% chance that he would live, but a 20% chance that it could be cured. He didn't want to take that chance. And I still don't know the answer to the question, and it's been asked in, in many different ways, but it's a complex question. This is where the quality of life of an individual, how important is that compared to the quantity of life of an individual? That's a very complex question uh, to be faced with. In my particular field, there's something very interesting where we set up our patients with radiotherapy with very, you know, a great deal of exactitude. And we use a mark on the skin, which is basically a tattoo. And that is, you put a, um, a, a needle there, you pour some ink, and then it's indelibly etched into the skin. It's a mark. Okay, if you don't know that much about Allah, you can say, okay, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. But it doesn't come up that often, but it's a sif in Shulchan Aruch on what's called Kisof Kaka, the placement of tattoos. Now we think of tattoos as big pictures that are all over the, uh, the individual's arm and 
face and who knows what. Actually, I remember when I was in Einstein, I had a professor and he always asked the patient who had a tattoo one question, are you happy you had this tattoo? It was 20 years later. And it was about 75% of all patients who were asked said, I don't think I would have done this again. Maybe it was a whim. But what about halacha? Is that mark considered a tattoo? And if it is, should it, it should be prohibited. But maybe on the other hand, in order to deliver this treatment so precisely, maybe it would be acceptable. And I remember speaking to Rabbi David Feinstein, and I remember speaking to Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky about it as well. And the resounding answer was, yes, it is permitted. It is permitted because it's part and parcel of Pikuach Nefesh. It's part and parcel of your delivering a life-important therapy. The questions I get are constant. I'll just tell you, just to show you, that it was just two days ago that I had the following two questions, which were, somebody called me Arab Shabbos, and he, he is a Rav, Sfardi Rav, and he's getting surgery this coming Tuesday at Mount Sinai Hospital, and he is very, very religious, and he has a long beard. And the question was, can he get the surgery on his neck and just tell them to, you know, leave the beard as is? No, that doesn't work. So the question was, can he insist that they just use a scissor to cut things? Or is it permitted to use a shaver or a razor? Which is, uh, you know, an extremely interesting question. Here's another question I got just last week. I, was, I do procedures on patients, and this patient said, I need you to do one thing for me before this procedure. I said, what? He said, here is a cloth of a mezuzah. I want you to put this under my pillow while the surgery is ongoing. Very complicated question, which is, are you allowed to use the kedushas cloth, the kedushas mezuzah, and put this under uh, the person's head during the procedure. So in the final analysis, we are always, we always need to learn. We always need to be asking questions because these questions are not really the same. And there is an art to asking a Shiloh, and I think this is so critically important to anybody going into the healthcare field. And that is two important aspects, number one, if you're going to ask a Shiloh, get all the facts 100% correct. If you don't know the percentages of how likely this is to be successful, or how likely, the, the, what condition the spread of the disease is, or what's the background information, and it's too sketchy, you are not able to ask that Shiloh. That Shiloh must be asked with an incredible amount of information because that's what the post relies upon. The, less, the, the least amount of information, the less effective and the less meaningful is the psaac. And then the second, which I believe, just from experience, is so critically important, is if it's at all possible, I think the doctor should be giving the medical information to the post and not the patient. I, I had one situation where Rav Chaim Kanievsky Shlita was asked about whether an experimental treatment should be given for something that had spread to the brain. And the way it was asked was as follows. Um, what would the Rub say, this the patient was asked, the, the, the family was asking, what would the Rub say about this experimental therapy that really we have no idea if it works and it, it may cause a great deal of harm. Should that person go through the therapy? I heard it, actually, it was an audio, and I heard that was the way it was asked. Of course, we, we could all anticipate what the answer is. And then when I, and it was written out, and then when I said, no, change this sentence and change this sentence, and it was obviously with the inflections very much changed, the psaac and the answer changed. And that puts 
a tremendous onus, a tremendous obligation on each and every physician to ask the questions correctly, get all of the facts, and give it over to the post in a, the clearest way possible. So I think, as I'm near concluding, the doctor's obligation is to know the facts, to keep medicine, the updated in medicine, to familiarize himself or herself with relevant halacha, and finally, to restore the health of the patient. You know, we, we know from Barapo Yerape is, the Gemara says, Mikan nitna rishus l'rofe l'rape. It's a, it's, it's, per, you're permitted as a physician to carry on the divine work of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and heal, yeshut of healing. But the Rambam, a very famous Rambam in Parish HaMishnayis in Nadarim, says that the obligation to heal is more than a rishus. It's a true obligation based on an extension of returning a lost object, baji, also low. The health is, is what you own. And if, God forbid, you lose your health, it's a lost object, and we all know lost objects you need to return to the owner. That is the fear of, of giving over, giving back, restoring the health. But what I'd like to suggest to you today, that it's just not restoring the physical health. It's restoring the emotional health of the patient. It's restoring their confidence. It's restoring their well-being through feeling good about the will to live and the need for Ishtadlus to go on further with life. Even if a person knows that this is the last step around, don't give up. It's tefillah. You, you have to be realistic to your patients and give them the real information. But the patient, and even the doctor, need to continue their bakoshos and their tefillahs as well. We have to realize that statistics in medicine can cause great confusion among patients. When you say there's a 25% <coughs> chance that you'll live that is incredibly harsh for a patient to hear. But that's statistics. That's what we see, but that's not always the case. That's not the individual. The individual is it either works or not works. In Mazel Yisrael, Kal Yisrael is a Milo Minateva. And we need to do all of the Ishtadas, all of the input necessary to be able to achieve or hopefully see a cure. And before concluding this evening, I'd like to just tell you a story of an individual who actually is from this uh, general community here in Brooklyn. And it impacted on me in an incredible way. About, this person was about 25 years of age. He had a testicular tumor. And often they're very, very curable. Um, and we treated him. Uh, there was a small surgery that was done, and radiation treatments were given. He was absolutely fine. Five years later, I meet him at a hotel for Pesach, and he's doing well. It was so strange that one week later, after seeing him for five, after five years, he's been free of any disease. He has pain in his abdomen, and after scans were done here at Maimonides, I believe, it was a huge growth all over his abdomen. He came to our hospital at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and one of the doctors said, it's so widespread, you have three months to live. I asked one of the top abdominal surgeons at our hospital, Dr. Murray Brennan at the time, and he said, look, I'll give it a try. He operated. But it was only 45 minutes later, I wanted to come to the operating room and see what's happening. And I see him walking out of the operating room. And when, and when a long surgery is transformed into a short surgery, that's not always a great thing. And I said, how did it go? He said, I don't really understand it so well, but whatever was there, which was incredibly large, 
kind of popped out at me. I removed it. I don't know what it is right now, but it looked very, very serious. About two weeks later, the pathology came back, and it was totally benign. I can't understand that. And if you go by statistics, it can't be explained, but it was benign. That was 20 years ago, and I spoke to him just last week. An incredible miracle, perhaps. A mazel Yisrael. We go by statistics, and we can tell somebody he only has six months to live. We have to be realistic to our patients, but at the same time, we recognize that there is a Yad Hashem, there is Yad HaDashmaya, there is Hashem who is really overseeing every aspect of, our med of the medical care. We are indeed shutvin, we are indeed partners with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this very special field of healthcare and medicine. And ultimately, when we recognize as physicians that we are observing, when you look at for it, the Yad Hashem, we could take what medicine sometimes is called an avodas technique, a technical service, a technical job, and make it into avodas hakodesh, a spiritual one. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Dr. Zosky, for your insightful words.